Good morning and welcome to you all. Welcome back to Jubilee Life. I trust that you're all doing well and it's such a blessing that you're here with us and I really pray and trust that you've been blessed by the service already and that God is going to bless you by the service today. Um, If you've been with us for a few weeks, you may know that we're in a series called Foundations where we're just looking at really the building blocks of this faith called Christianity. What does it mean to be a Christian and what are the things that we should be building our faith upon? And for this, we've been walking through the book of Ephesians, and we're going to jump into Ephesians chapter 3 today. So if you've got your Bibles, please turn with me to the book of Ephesians, and we're going to start from chapter 3. I'm going to read from verse 7. It says, Of this gospel I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light everyone what is the sorry to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that here it is through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places come with me to verse 14 of the same chapter it says for this reason I bow my knees before the father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge. And that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Jesus, thank you for being here with us right now. Thank you for the gospel, Lord God, the good news that you came and you died and you resurrected and you left your spirit here with us, Lord God. That when we meet in twos and threes, as we meet virtually right now, Lord God, you are here amongst us, Lord God. And I just pray that as I speak, Father, that you will just reveal more of yourself, Lord God. Everyone listening, you'll just reveal more of yourself, Lord God, so that people will grow in you, Lord God. Know your heart more, Lord God. Know your way more, Lord God. In your name I pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Paul, here in Ephesians chapter 3, is praying and talking to the church. In fact, this, this, this letter, the, 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 the book of Ephesus, this epistle, it is written to the church. It's written to the church in Ephesus, and Ephesians really is about the church. The first three chapters definitely is talking about the gospel and the application of the gospel to the church. And then we look at the the latter three chapters, and it's really talking about the application of those things. But overall, it is a message to the church. And here in chapter 3, we have a really important moment where Paul is essentially hinging the letter. He is praying to God, and he's got this one message with his prayer. It's a really powerful prayer that he has for the church. And he prays that the church would be rooted and grounded in love. Together with all God's holy people, that they'll be able to grasp what is the height and the length and the depth of God's love. And that they will know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge and be filled with the fullness of God. That's the prayer that Paul has for the church. Remember, he's writing this from a prison. There's, there's a sense of urgency and, and power that is, and authority that is in this prayer. And you might be thinking, like I thought, why was this his topic or subject of prayer? Of all the things to ask God for, more members, more finances, more stability, less persecution, more power. No, he prays that they would simply know the love of Christ. And I think really to answer that question, of why was this Paul's prayer to the church? We must look at what the church is. What is the church? Because I guess we have a bit of a funny understanding of what the church is. In fact, when, when, when you ask people, what is the church? Most people nowadays, they'll give you an answer of the church is not a building. The church is the people. But I, th- I, think, I think Christ had a bit more in mind or there's a bit more to that answer than we get from people normally. When we say, what is the church? It's not just people there's people with a function with a movement and so that's the first question i want to ask what is the church and the first point i have for you underneath that is the church is the body of christ we're going a bit more in depth as to what the church is the church is the body of christ come with me to the book of ephesians chapter 1 and verse 22 
It says, and he put all things under his feet and gave him, he's talking about Jesus. He put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church. As head of all things to the church, which is his body. The fullness of him who fills all in all. That's Ephesians. That's Paul talking. He says, the church is the body of Christ. The church is the body of Christ. What is a body? If we think about our bodies, our bodies are, they carry out the actions that come up, that we come up with in our head. My leg can't just start walking on its own. I must decide to get up and walk. All instruction comes from the head and the body follows. The body carries out the will of the head. Just like the church carries out the will of the head, which is Jesus Christ. That's what we're meant to do. In fact, when Jesus was here in a physical body, what was he here to do? Most people will say, oh, he was here to come and die for us or he's here to come and do miracles. He was here to, you know, be a carpenter or be a son. No, Jesus was here to do the will of the Father. And now as us, his body, we are here to do the will of Jesus, the head of the church. But there's a problem. The problem is us, humans. We have free will. We have free will. Right from the time that we're born, we can choose to respond in certain ways. We can choose certain directions to walk in and do things. And you see, what happens is free will very quickly becomes self-will. Free will quickly turns into self-will. You can ask any parent how quick this is apparent in kids. Because you see, with, with babies and kids and they can't talk and all of that, certain sins, they, they aren't really apparent in them. Because they seem so young and so innocent. But one thing we see really clearly in children as young as one years old or younger is they have self-will. In fact, I think of... I was going to say me, but really it's my brother. When we were younger, he was that kid that would want to touch the thing that he's not supposed to touch. And my mom would tell me stories of Femi being told, don't put your hand in the video cassette player. Don't do that. And he's standing there and he's about to put his hand in. And he hears my mom say, don't. And he looks at my mom. And he looks at the video cassette player. And he itches a bit closer. She says, don't. And he looks at my mom. And he inches a bit closer. And then you know when babies do that kind of, they're inching and looking at the same time to see if, they, if you're still looking, if you're still looking, if you're still looking. Mom says, don't touch it, don't touch it. And then he touches it and starts laughing and smiling. You see, even though he was such a young boy, even though we were all old babies do that, any parent will tell you the baby has self-will and self-will leads to disobedience. And you see, that's what happens with us in the church. Yes, we are his body and we are meant to do the will of the head. We're meant to be doing the will of the father, but... What we end up doing a lot of the time is what we want to do. We end up doing what we want to do and end up being contrary to everything that the head has asked us to do. Find it for me. It's about this child and his dad comes home and the child's standing up and the, the, the dad says, sit down. And the boy says, no. And the dad, a bit bemused as you would be, as the dad, the dad looks over and says, I said, sit down. And the kid said, no. And now the dad's getting a little bit, he's fretting a little bit and he picks up a stick. He says, sit down. And the kid said, the kid sits down. And the kid, dad is about to turn away and walk up and he said, dad, dad, just to let you know, inside I'm still standing up. You see, what can end up happening when we, as the body is, you can start getting a little bit legalistic and start doing things which look like you're doing the will of the Father. It looks like you're doing the right thing, but really on the inside, you're not being obedient. See, God's idea for the church was not to be a mindless body, to be, but to be an active and mindful body that is doing what he wants because they've had a change of heart, not just a change of, I don't know, head. <laughs> not just because of, you know, action but because they have been completely and utterly reversed and changed around. That is what it means to be the body of Christ. That is what God wants us to be. The hand doesn't just get to do what it wants anymore, but it's had a change. The direction all comes from the head. This talks about how do you respond? How do you conduct yourself? How do you speak? How do you prioritize? Is the, are these things all governed by Jesus, the head, or is it still self-will? Number one, what is the church? The church is the body of Christ. Number two, it is the family of Christ. Call me 2 Corinthians 2. Sorry, 1 Corinthians verse 12. And um, sorry, chapter 12 and verse 25. It says, this is the part where it talks about the church. It's many members like a body. And it ends with this. It says, 
He's talking about the body. He says that there may be no division in the body. That's us, the church. But that the members have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, then all suffer together. And if one member is honored, then all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and you're individually members of it. Now I love this. I don't know if you've ever watched those nature programs and you see like a school of fish. Like all, all, all those birds that all fly together. It's like they're all individual members of this big group, but they go in the same direction. It's kind of that picture that this is given of the church, that if we are, one, we are individuals, we are individual members, but we come together as one and we celebrate together and we suffer together like a family or like the Bible's idea of a family should be. You see, even in life, we, we, we may have had different family experiences, but one thing I'm sure a lot of us have had is when, when your friends become your family. Like, I, I know I've got some friends that have become my family. In fact, we've got a WhatsApp group, and the name of it is family. Now, there's no blood relation in there, but we are family. And the reason that I know that they're family, and the reason I know that they're family members, is not because of the times that were good. Not because of all of the things, when things are going well, and the sun's out, and we're having barbecues, and yeah, it's really easy to get along. But no, when people have been inconsistent, when people have been hurting, when people have been suffering... When people have done wrong, when I've done wrong, are they still around? Are they still with me? Are they still around me, championing me, suffering with me? There have been some times when something bad has happened to me and some of my best friends, they've been, it looks like they're more hurt than I am. That's how my friends became my family. And you see, here in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where it talks about celebrating together and suffering together, it really gives the idea that the body of Christ is not just meant to be a body of separate members, but is meant to be a united family. And how does this translate to the church? You see, when Jesus fed the 5,000, there was a lot of people there, obviously, more than 5,000 people there. But how many were by his side when he was hanging on the cross? You see, when it comes to family and the reality of what a family is, there are some things that a family needs. Investment, protection, patience, and love. Investment of what? Your time, your, your advice. <laughs> Investment of, of, of all of you, basically. Protection of that person. You're not going to let that person go through certain things. You're going to try and shield that person from certain things. Patience. Patience for that person to grow. Patience for that, per- patience for that person to learn. And all encapsulated by love, you're going to love the person that is your family member. You see, we as a church are not just called to be people that come and congregate once a week on a Sunday, say hello to each other and walk past. No, we're called to be there like family members, celebrate with each other and suffer together. United as a body under the headship and leadership of Jesus Christ through highs and through lows. You see, being a part of a family doesn't just speak of your attendance, but it speaks of your engagement. Merely attending the family function doesn't make you an active part of that family, but engaging in the family affairs does. So we can no longer be people that sit back and say, what can the church do for me? But rather we say, this is my family and how can I play a part? How can I be a part of this movement and this thing that God has established called the church? We are the body, meaning we're under the headship of Christ. We are a family, meaning we love one another like so. Thirdly, we are his representatives. We are the representatives of Christ. I don't know if you've ever been to an embassy before. You might have been to an embassy before. I've been to a few embassies in my life. Um, I've been to the American embassy. The American embassy, it's interesting. Because you walk in there, it's, it's, it's in Vauxhall. You walk in there and the accents change, the uniforms change, the fonts change, everything changes. And suddenly you start thinking, I mean, I know I'm not in America, but this kind of feels like America. And they were very polite. You speak to the person at the desk and they're an American and everything there is just American. The voice of the title is American. Everything sounds American, even though you're on UK soil. Or, or another, another embassy that I've been to is the Russian embassy, believe it or not. Now, I don't know if they turned the temperature down a little bit on purpose or what. But you walk into that embassy and it is so clear from the moment you touch that you are no longer on UK soil. As in you walk in and... Just the whole vibe of the place changes. I I would need a whole sermon to talk about Russia and our trips there. It was interesting, but it started with the embassy. They have a certain um, strictness that we don't really have in Britain. 
It was a great, I mean, yeah, we, we got in a little bit of trouble there, but it was great. It was great. It was very, it was very insightful, this embassy. Or I've, been, I've managed to evade the Nigerian embassy up until now. But I've been reliably informed, reliably informed that once you set foot in the Nigerian embassy, you're no longer in the UK at all. <laughs> the rules of the UK do not apply in the Nigerian embassy. But you know why that is? It's because you're no longer in the UK. You see, an embassy is a representative of a country in a foreign land. So if you, and it's sovereign territory. So if you are in a different country and you got in trouble, run to the UK, the British embassy, run there. (laughs) Because you'll be on British land, right? The church of Jesus Christ is the embassy of heaven here on earth. And we are kingdom ambassadors in this embassy. Though we're located here, we are not from here, which means we do not play by these rules. We're different. We're other. In fact, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it says, you are a chosen people, a holy nation, a royal priesthood. You're not from here. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, it says, our citizenship is in heaven. That means your passport says heaven. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 19, it says, it calls us citizens and saints and members of God's household. You see, we are, as the church representatives of the kingdom of heaven. We are ambassadors of Jesus Christ here. And see, when you're part of the church, you have a completely different set of values and culture to the world. It's different. We've come from a different place. And you see, just like I said earlier about attendance versus engagement, attending doesn't make you an effective ambassador of heaven. It's a bit like saying buying an buying a Arsenal football top doesn't make you an Arsenal football player. But you engaging in the game and being in the game and being in the sport and doing the things... That will make you a professional footballer. That's what makes you it. You can pretend all you want, but only until you start engaging and doing the things that make you a footballer will you be a footballer. The same way when it comes to being ambassador of God, we can go to, we can go to a church every Sunday. That doesn't make you an ambassador. It doesn't make you an effective representative of God on the world, in the world. We've got to get into the game. And what does that look like? It looks like what, what's your response to the poor, to the hungry? What's your response to injustice? What are your priorities and what do you do with your time? What is your worship and how do you sacrifice? That's what it looks like. Answering those questions and doing what God says about those things is being a kingdom representative. And he's kind of asking right now, God is asking right now, do you represent me? Now, do you represent me in your daily life? Do you do the things that I ask you to do? Do you represent me, really represent me in your daily life? Or, do you, or, or is it more of a week to week attendance? God's body, God's family, God's representatives, and God's plan. That's the title of your sermon, actually. God's plan. God's plan. The church is his plan. Everyone say his plan. The church is his plan. The church, it says in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, it says that I will, Jesus is talking to Peter, he says, and I will build my church. It's the first use of the word church in the Bible. Jesus Christ established the church. It wasn't some monarch during the 16th century that had political and social you know, persuasions and wasn't driven by it. It wasn't any of that. It wasn't any of those myths. The church was established by Jesus Christ. And you see, there's a lot of churches. There's a lot of churches up and down the world, up and down the loud, that doesn't look like Jesus built them. You might have Jesus' name on the front or you might say church on the front, but... Unless you're doing what Christ asked you to do, unless you're doing what the head has asked you to do, unless you're following his lead, then you're not the church that Jesus established and the church that Jesus built. If you're not the legislative, spiritual, authoritarian presiding over a certain area, a given area, on behalf of God, then it might just be your... uh, some kind of spiritual massage weekly with a little bit of Jesus sprinkled on top. The church is the legislation of God here on earth, his representatives here on earth. And it's his plan. I mean, Revelation chapter two and chapter three shows us that not every church is doing what Christ has asked them to do. Verse one, the church in Sardis, which says, you have a reputation of being alive, but you're really dead. Or verse 15, the church in Laodicea, which says, your works are neither hot nor cold, so I spit you out. 
This is all things that Jesus is saying about the church. To be the church is not just people gathering. It's people that are gathering under his name and being his representative here on earth. And it's his plan. So why did God make the church? Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 10, it says that, So through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known for the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. I read that right at the start. The church was established by Jesus Christ and it's his plan for the change in the world. That's why God established the church and that's what the church is for. It says that, let me read that again, that God might be made known for the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. Governments and authorities and people of all, from all manners of life but should be able to look at the church when they don't know what to do. And the church should be able to say, we have the answers. The church is God's constitution here on earth. He is the head, it's his will, it's his way. We are his body and we are his representatives. And everyone said, amen. Number two, the call of the church. What is the call of the church? I want to read some verses from the book of Matthew chapter 16 and verse 13. It says, now Jesus came into the district of Caesarea of Philippi and he asked the disciples, who do people say that the son of man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist and others say Elijah and others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he, had, and he said to them, but who do you, and he's talking to the disciples, he says, who do you all say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are Christ, son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father in heaven. And I tell you, you, Peter, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. This is Jesus talking about the church. This is where it talks about the church first in the Bible. And just to explain, he says to, people, he says to all the disciples, who do people say that I am? And he said, this prophet or that prophet or this thing, or, you know, really established people like Elijah and, and, and Jeremiah and John the Baptist. This is what people are saying you are. And Jesus says, okay, but who do you say that I am? And Peter hits the jack for Peter says, you're Christ, son of the living God. And Jesus' response to Peter is incredible because he changes his name there. He's a Simon Bar Jonah. Flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven revealed this to you. I, you weren't listening to the people around you, you weren't leaning even on your own understanding. You went by what my Father in heaven said, and you had the faith and the boldness and the courage to say that and declare me as a Christ, regardless of what everyone else was saying. And he says, You. You are Peter, and on this rock I shall build my church. Now, Jesus uses a little bit of wordplay here, which I find incredible. He says, you are Peter, or the Greek word there, Petros, meaning stone. And on this rock, or Greek word there, Petra, I will build my church. What Jesus is saying there is, you see what you just did there, Peter, not leaning on your own understanding, but following the will of the Father and answering in faith and boldness and courage? You're now a stone. And you see, on this rock, or back in that context, the rock would be stones gathered together and bound together tightly. On this rock, I will build my church. What's Jesus saying there? He says, on this kind of person, bound together with other people like this, I will build and I will establish my church. And if Peter was here right now, he would say, come with me to 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4 and 5, because he says, You yourselves, like living stones, Petros, are being built up as a spiritual house, the church. So number one for you underneath this, what is the call of the church? It is to be united. We are to be united. God wants not just one stone here and one stone here and the living stone over here. No, he wants the living stones to come together and be united as one body, one family. And upon those people, he will build his church. And it says that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The gates of hell will not prevail against people that are unified underneath the headship of Jesus Christ. Not individuals, the church. People who have faith and have courage and do his will and do his way, regardless of what the culture is saying, regardless of what the land is doing. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against the united church of Jesus Christ. And everyone said, Amen. 
the call of the church. Number one, to be united. Number two, to exercise spiritual authority. Verse 18, it says, The gates of hell shall not prevail, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom. I will give you the keys of the kingdom. The gates of hell shall not prevail, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Keys unlock these locks. They unlock the gates. They overcome the gates. Gates, plural. Keys, plural. And we constantly come up against gates as individuals and as a church, as the church. Persecutions and hardships and all manner of things that the devil tries to throw in our way to stop us doing the will of the Father. And the gates are only overcome by the right keys, the keys of the kingdom. Now, let me tell you a story about me and my car, my old car, my trusty old car. Those who will remember, it was a Toyota Yaris Verso T3 with one wing mirror. Uh, it was about four different colors by the time I sold it. Um, great car. It had no bumper. Great car. Great car. Trusty. And you, one thing you'll know about Toyotas is for their interesting hardware, they've got good engines. That car never failed me. I used to drive so much. So, oh, I love that car. And there was this one day that I was sitting at uni. I had a few of my friends around. And I lived a little bit far off campus, and, and I had a couple of friends around, and we had a lecture coming up. And I said, you know what, guys? Don't worry. Chill. I'm going to drive in. I'm going to drive into campus today, so you guys can relax. And we waited a few minutes, and you know, it was all good. And I said, right, let's go. Let's go. And I jumped in the car. Well, I pulled out my key. I put the key in the door to unlock the door. See, you guys don't even remember that you, have to, you used to have to do that. You're, you, you have these fancy cars, you just walk past and it magically opens. But you put the, the key in the car, turned it, opened it. I had to turn around to unlock everyone else's doors. The key, the key worked. I got in the car, everyone got in the car. And I put my key in the ignition. And I turned the key and I heard that, <laughs> the most hurtful sound ever. The car went, I said, no, not today. <laughs> not today to your... I did it two times, three times, four times. And my friends are now getting a little bit nervous saying, TJ, why didn't we just walk? I said, wait, wait, wait. No, no, no. The key, I, I don't understand. My engine was working this morning. I don't understand. And I pulled out the key and I looked at the key and there was a big fat hole in the middle of the key. As in, on, 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 the, on the chunky bit of the key, there was a hole in it. Now, the key was the right shape. It was the right size. The key fit. It looked like it did everything right, but there was one problem. The chip on the inside of the key was missing. I have no idea how this happened, but the chip on the inside of the key was missing. So even though it was the right shape, it was the right size, it even fit in the door, it looked like it was doing the right thing, it did not have the authority to start my car. See, when we're talking about the keys of the kingdom, there's keys, there's certain things that only the church can overcome through Jesus Christ because we're the only ones who have been given the keys with authority. It's not good enough to just look right. It's not good enough to just sound right. It is a spiritual battle. We don't fight against flesh and blood, but we fight against other principalities and powers that are not from this earth, meaning that every problem that we see has an invisible and spiritual source. And that's the fight that we are called to fight as the church, the unified church of Jesus Christ. We can't be drawing for the earthly keys. We have to draw for the spiritual keys. We must be a praying people. We must be a praying, a people that prays without ceasing. Even says, Jesus even says, no, some, some problems can only be overcome by praying and fasting. And we know that, we know that in the earth, there's so many problems in the earth and everyone looking to the government. Unless, unless you, I mean, no one has a clue right now. No one knows what they're doing right now. But the church has the keys of the kingdom. We must use the authority that we've been given through Christ Jesus. And to do that, we must, and this is the next one for you, implement kingdom culture. Implement kingdom culture. This is what spiritual authority looks like. What's culture? Culture is beliefs, ideals, behaviors, and values. That's really what culture is. Beliefs, ideals, behaviors, and values. You see, you can always tell when someone's not from this, I guess, not from this country. By their driving. Yeah? By their driving. I mean, especially shout out to my Nigerian brothers and sisters, my Turkish brothers and sisters, my Indian brothers and sisters, my Indonesian brothers and sisters, because I've been to Indonesia. It took me half an hour to cross the road. And not because of anything other than the fact that the way that they were taught to drive was 
you see a space and you go for it. And even just little smaller things like beeping their horn, they beep their horn to let you know that you might crash into them. Sorry, that they might crash into you. <laughs> they let you know, hey, hey, I'm coming on your side. So, so you can know where they're coming and they'll weave in and out of you. And then when they come to England, where everything's nice and polite and we have road signs and, you know, green men. <laughs> and they're going for spaces and beeping, letting everyone know, hey, I'm coming through, I'm coming through. It's like, whoa, different culture. Different culture. And you see, what happens over time to these people is they, they'll come from a different country where they've learned to drive in their own way, which is great, and they come to this country and it doesn't quite fit the culture. And what happens over time? After being sworn at a million times, they start to, they start to learn. <laughs> they start to learn how to drive a little bit. They start to learn how to drive in the way of our culture. They get tamed. And you see, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, it says, remember, you are foreigners and exiles here. So you have to wage war to stop the, 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 the other cultures seeping into your kingdom culture. You have, to, you have to fight to keep hold of the thing that you learned from back home, from heaven, from God. You have to fight to keep hold of that. You have to wage war to keep hold of that. You have to wage war to not become tamed. Do you remember what it was like when you first became a Christian? And it was like, you just see Jesus in everything. You're like, thank you, Lord, for the birds and the trees and this and that. You're thanking God for absolutely everything. It's just, you're walking around and someone says hi to you. And you're like, have you met Jesus? You're just so happy. You're so, oh my gosh, I love this God. And what happens over time? Worldly culture starts to seep into kingdom culture. And you bring in light into the dark places. Suddenly, you can't uphold that anymore. But what the Bible tells us to do is to wage war and to fight for this, to fight for this culture. To be unafraid, unafraid to bring your home culture to the world, to this foreign land. And what this means is you're going to look different. You're going to look different. Whether it's money, all your friends spending money on a certain thing and wondering why aren't you spending on that. But you just know in your heart that you can't, you can't spend money on that when there are poor people, when there's people that don't have enough food in the, on the very streets of London. And so you're not going to have certain things. In your relationships where you're, you're thinking, you know what, I, I, I might love this person and I really like them. And they're telling you, no, 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 you're only 25. Just relax. Enjoy your life. And you know, wait, but, but that's different from the culture that I have. Just going out and doing whatever I want. Or, or, or maybe when it comes to the things that you consume, you might not watch things. You might not drink the same things. You might not smoke the same things as all of them. You're going to look different if you have kingdom culture coming out of you. Because you're going to be going around breathing light into dark spaces and being a spiritual authority, the spiritual authority all over the earth. But God doesn't just leave you there. It says that whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Meaning that whatever you restrict here on earth, you're going to get heaven's backing spiritually. And whatever you loosen, let's take strongholds for example, you're, you're loosening those and you're going to get heaven's backing here on earth. You're not doing it alone even though you have to wage war and even though it's difficult to always be implementing kingdom culture, you are not alone in that and we are called to do it as a church. And I guess it's best put in Isaiah chapter 61 verse 1 where it says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. He has proclaimed liberty to the captives and the opening of prison doors to those who are bound. That is our job as Christians but the Spirit is with you and is upon you. I'm going to just start rounding up here. Number three, grounded and rooted in his love. Now we've looked at what the church is and what the call of the church is. Let's look back at Paul's prayer. Why did he pray so earnestly? My prayer for the church. I know all that they're going to go through. But my prayer for the church is that they will just know your love, Jesus. That they will know the love of you that surpasses knowledge, to be honest. That they would know, why was that his overwhelming and prevailing prayer for the church? Well, I would suggest to you that when you know the love of Christ, you have the strength to carry out his will. You have the confidence to carry out his will. You have the courage to carry out his will. First of all, it says, this is, this is the first thing that, that I picked up on it. He says that you would know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Now, some of you might be thinking, how can you know something that surpasses knowledge? How can, how can Paul be praying that I know something that surpasses knowledge? Well, the best example I can think of that is, 
I could tell you that Mount Everest is 8,400 meters tall. You don't really know how tall it is, do you? You won't really know how tall Mount Everest is until you stand at the summit. And you look around and you feel how thin the air is and how cold it is and you can see the curvature of the earth. Not until that will you really know the gravity of how big this mountain is. And what Paul is saying there is that he's not saying that you will know logically what the love of Christ is, but that you will know experientially what the love of Christ is. And that's his prayer for the church. And the reason he prays this is because when you realize and when you recognize just how much Christ loves you, it gives you the confidence and power to step out and be countercultural for him. It gives you the confidence and you feel the necessity that I am going to join with these people, not just because I was told to, but because I have had a change of heart, because, not for, because I loved him first, but because he first loved me. That's what Paul is saying here. And that's why he's praying for the church over everything. Just let them know your love, God. I just pray that they experience your love because when they catch your love, everything changes. I mean, there's a song that I love which says, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. That is what Paul is praying right here. It's like the kid standing on the edge of a swimming pool and his dad standing in saying, jump, jump into my arms. And there's a stranger next to the dad saying, no, 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 jump into my arms. And the dad's like, no, 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 I care for you. And the stranger's like, no, I care for you as well. But the kid's going to jump into the arms of his dad. Why? Because he's experienced his love before. He's had a, a feeling and an understanding of the love that the father had before. He's jumped in before and the father never dropped him. You see, when you experience the love of the father, you have the courage to do more for him. And you have the courage to be the authentic church of Jesus Christ. So really quickly, I know I've run out of time. Be rooted. Be rooted. Don't be like the seed that falls on shallow ground. What does shallow ground look like? It's the attendees. You hear the word. You might even be able to quote some retweetable phrases back to me from the sermon today. But I'm talking about that is only a little bit. You have to be someone that is constantly in and engaged. The attendance no longer cuts it. You must be engaged. Because when you're just surface level and you're just shallow, you realize that when the gates of hell come against you, you're, you were never part of the body. You're on the periphery. You've been called to be rooted here. It's more than just a one line. It's more than just what's hot at the time. It's more than whether you like the preacher at the church or whether you like the worship at the church or not. The church is more than the preacher. The church is, is more than whether or not you like the worship. The church is a movement and a mission and a family. And it's under the, it's the kingdom's end embassy and it's under the headship of Jesus Christ. That's what the church is. We can't keep using church to gain from we have to be people that are part of this mission the mission and the cause of jesus christ be rooted number two be grounded be grounded in his love if you want to hear more about how much god loves you go and listen to the sermon from last week he loves you a lot <laughs> catch on to it listen to it as much as you need to because when you experience and you get his love you are grounded when the storm comes and the wind comes and the rain comes and everything's crashing all over you know that your father in heaven still loves you and he didn't bring you this far to let you go so you just hold on to the master of the master and you keep sailing. Be rooted, be grounded. And thirdly, make your love his, make his love your foundation. His love is immeasurable. His love is outrageous. His love is absolutely crazy. <laughs> He's crazy about you. He absolutely loves you. He will leave 99 to come and find you. This is the God that we serve, the God of the universe that cares about you so much. He knows every single hair on your head. He loves you that much. So like I just said, when the storm comes and the waves crash, make sure you've been building your life on the foundation of his love. Not the love of any earthly thing. Not your own power or your own feelings or your own success. Build your life on the love of God that surpasses all knowledge because it is a firm foundation. I just want to pray over everyone right now. So if you close your eyes. Jesus, I thank you for this time that we've had just learning about your church. Learning about the mission that you have called the church. The plan, your plan to change the world. 
that people would know your son, the church. And I just pray, Lord, that as we make your love our foundation, as we're rooted and grounded in your love, Lord God, that you would make of us strong people, a strong church that is no longer about self-will, but is about the will of the Father. It's about doing your business here on earth, Lord God. No longer selfish, but selfless. No longer self-centered, but God-centered. And as we build on your love, give us the courage to do that, Lord God. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.